Hello once again. In today's video, we're taking a look at another piece of vintage video equipment that I have kicking around here. This is a Sony model SVO1410 VHS VCR, and it was made in 1992. And after I'm done taping today's video, this VCR is actually going to be going away, which I'm very excited about. Uh, it is going to someone who said they would like to have it. I'll explain that a bit more later, but yeah. Uh, I'm not keeping this thing because it actually has uh, a few issues. It has a few electronic issues and then it actually has a mechanical issue as well, which I'll explain a bit later. But uh, I've had this for about a year and a half. Uh, I actually got this from the TV station. This belonged to the TV station. I don't know if it's always been the TV stations or if it originally belonged to a different TV station. But this VCR is really unique in a couple of ways. First of all, this was not built by Sony. This was actually made by Sanyo, and then Sony just rebranded it. Second of all, uh, even though this works like any ordinary VHS VCR, this thing was actually made and sold for the industrial and commercial markets. This is actually a commercial grade VCR and while it does have a couple of differences uh, to a normal consumer unit which we'll see in this video largely it's just cosmetic <laughs> this thing this thing was actually based on a consumer Sony VHS VCR and they just changed it cosmetically for the commercial market and they made a couple other changes to make it more suitable for the commercial market but yeah really interesting this was made by Sanyo and it's a commercial market unit. The fact that Sony themselves didn't make this isn't actually that special. Many of Sony's VHS VCRs were actually made by Sanyo. And it's kind of funny when you learn why. Of course, in the beginning, Sony only made their Betamax VCRs. Um, but obviously, Betamax lost to VHS and by the mid 80s it had only a very tiny percentage of the home video market compared to VHS. Um, but nonetheless Sony uh, held their ground and continued to make only Betamax VCRs until 1989. That was the year Sony finally threw in the towel on the VHS versus Betamax war by introducing their first VHS VCR and of course not surprisingly perhaps they had no interest in actually developing their own VHS VCR so they just asked Sanyo to make it for them and as a matter of fact it's largely unchanged from the equivalent model that Sanyo themselves would have sold under their own name I don't know uh, what Sanyo model that is anymore but Sanyo did sell this under their own name as well. Here's another kind of oddity about this VCR is that despite uh, being an industrial slash commercial grade unit um, this does not have all of the luxuries if you will that even a consumer model might have. This is a forehead dual azimuth unit with mono sound, forehead mono, so not hi-fi stereo or even linear stereo. And you might wonder, geez, well, why would, why would they make a commercial grade VCR and not even give it hi-fi stereo audio? I think the best way of describing it is that this was made to serve the same market as this Sony CVM-1271 video monitor was meant to serve. This is also a commercial grade piece of equipment that only provides basic functionality and it was meant to serve the market who wanted a commercial grade piece of equipment that you know might have been uh, physically a bit more durable and stuff like that but they only need basic functionality. I just want an monitor that I can shove a video source into and watch it and hear it. Here you go. Similarly, 
I'm in a commercial environment and I just want an VCR that I can shove a tape into and watch it and hear it. Here you go. So I kind of put these two things as being uh, two members of the same family in terms of the features they provide and the market they were meant to serve. The most hilarious piece of equipment I've ever heard of that goes by this philosophy is Sony actually made a Betacam uh, VCR uh, that was so basic that it only has a composite video output. Betacam, a component video format, which normally every model has all of composite, S-video, and component outputs on. But uh, Sony actually made a Betacam VCR with only a composite output, and they made it to serve this market, the commercial market that just wanted an Betacam VCR to shove a tape into and hear it and see it. So that's kind of hilarious. Anywho, let's take a look at what we got here. Um, you got your power button with a light. Remote sensor, this does, I do have the remote for this. I did not get this with a remote, but I bought this one on eBay. And uh, I believe this just uses regular Sanyo uh, remote codes. So this will work with other Sanyo built VCRs. Interesting remote, it's actually got a hard switch on it for TV and VCR. So you must be able to program this to control a TV as well. On the forefront, uh, very basic button layout on this. You've got your transport controls, record, channel up and down. This does have a cable tuner. This was VTR number three, apparently. You've got a big dual color vacuum fluorescent display and you can see one of the many electronic issues that this thing has. Uh, there is such severe ghosting in the display. The only thing lit up right now is the clock 111 and the PM indicator. But you can see everything is lit up and it actually, it's okay to read to the naked eye, but on camera it makes it very hard to read. Absolutely everything is lit up here. Um, so yeah, this... This thing is full of bad capacitors. Um, being made in 1992, this thing is a victim of the first capacitor plague of the late 80s, early 90s. And it's kind of ironic because Sony equipment is famous. Pretty much everything that Sony made in the late 80s and early 90s needs new caps now. But Sony didn't make this. This was made for them, and yet it's also a victim of the... Uh, capacitor plague of that era which is kind of funny but yeah this thing I think is full of bad capacitors when I first got this it worked fine it didn't have any electronic issues and I used it for a while and then I then I put it away for a few months and when I dug it out recently it wouldn't even power on there was absolutely no sign of life when you plugged it into the wall and it turned out that during the few months that this thing was sitting in the closet in my bedroom um, all the power supply capacitors had just rotted. Some of them leaked their guts out. And uh, in order to make this thing function again, I actually had to remove the power supply and replace the capacitors. Which was actually a pretty easy job to do. But yeah, uh, months of sitting made this thing go from perfect working to completely non-functional. And although I replaced some of the power supply capacitors enough to make it work again, they're still... Um, it, it now has other electronic issues that it didn't have when I first got this thing, which is why I'm now getting rid of it. I don't know if replacing the rest of the power supply capacitors would solve that issue or if it's got capacitors elsewhere. Um, I think either scenario is possible. But uh, I don't like this VCR enough to deal with trying to find that out. So I'm giving it away. Um, we have, uh, earlier this week I met a young guy, came to the station, a high school student, came to the TV station. Um, he got the grand tour, he was interested to check it out, and he got the grand tour, and we showed him everything we do, and I sat down with him for about half an hour, and it turns out he also collects vintage electronics. Um, we did a lot of talking, he actually reminds me a lot of myself at that age. Um... 
Um, but yeah, he, he has his own stash of old electronic stuff. Um, he is still learning about repairing stuff, but he does know some things. Um, and he was kind of interested in the Betacam VCR we have set up at the station, the PVW2600. And uh, I told him, I said, hey, I've got a VHS machine. It doesn't work that great anymore. Do you want it? And he said, yeah, absolutely. So, <laughs> so I'm taking this to the station. Next time he comes up, he's taking this home with him. Uh, I'm going to lose the 20 bucks or whatever I paid for this remote, but I don't really care. I'm uh, just going to be glad to have this thing out of my life. <laughs> but yeah, that's where this thing is going. But yeah, that's one electronic issue this has. Um, another electronic issue. When you're playing a tape and you press and hold the rewind or fast forward buttons to do reverse or forward search, it only does reverse or forward search for a split second and then it just goes back into play mode. You press the button and it just, for a split second, it goes into that mode and then just goes back to play mode. It works perfectly if you use the remote. Uh, you can hold fast forward or rewind or you can just press this search button and it works as expected. But you can't do it on the unit itself anymore. And I actually removed the front PCB that houses these buttons and the VFD and I replaced all the capacitors on that board and it didn't do anything so a waste of a few capacitors and a couple hours of my time but that's okay um, so yeah this that's <laughs> this thing has got some weird issues going on um, also now I have found that um, when you don't use it for a while be it a day or whatever and you put in a tape it takes several minutes for it to be able to see a picture um, in the first several minutes that you play a tape in this thing you just have noise on the screen you have perfect audio but you have noise on the screen so there's something going on with either the uh, head drum servo or the video head amplifier uh, or the tracking or something um, but after a few minutes SP comes in, and then a few minutes after that, LP and EP come in. Um, so yes, clearly, I, I'm guessing this thing is just full of bad capacitors. Fixable, yes. Worth it to me, no. I'm very happy to just uh, give this thing away as is. Anyway, that's the buttons, the display. You have a couple of LED indicators here. Um, this does do auto tracking, so you have a green LED right there that lights up when uh, the auto tracking is in progress. And you have a key inhibit. Uh, there's a switch under here. I might as well flip this down. You flip down this door, and among other things, there is a key inhibit switch. You turn that on, none of the keys work, and you have a red LED that lights up there to let you know that the uh, key inhibit is enabled. Other buttons under here, you have your input select, the cable tuner or the line in, sharpness control, tuner mode, normal or cable TV. You can uh, auto program the tuner channels where it scans through and then only enables the channels that actually have a signal on them. Uh, your TV VCR selector for uh, the RF pass-through. And you have your quick timer recording or QTR. Um, modern VCRs would call this OTR. But this is actually kind of an enhanced uh, version of OTR because not only can you set your record time either an hour, half an hour or an hour or an hour and a half, you know, in half hour increments, uh, you can also press the start time button to quickly tell it what time to start recording. It starts at the current time, and then each time you press start time, it adds 10 minutes. So it's kind of an enhanced one-time recording. Now you can choose not only your record time, but you can quickly choose the start time for it to start recording. Very nice. It's actually kind of nifty. And then most of the functionality on this is limited to the remote. You really do need the remote 
to use this thing, which is why I bought one off eBay, which is really too bad. Uh, you'd think a commercial piece of equipment would be uh, a bit better with the front panel controls, but nonetheless, uh, on the remote here, you got a volume control that would be for controlling the programmed TV. You can direct tune your channel for the cable tuner. This does have an index function, so every time you start recording, it records an index onto the tape. I don't know if that's like a sub-audible tone recorded onto the audio track, or if it records something in the uh, uh, vertical blanking interval. I don't know how it does it, but it does have an index function, which is really neat. So if you have several recordings you've made with this VCR on a tape and you want to go to a specific one, you can tell it what index to rewind or fast forward to. That's also pretty nifty. It's got a blank search, so it can search for a blank portion of the tape and uh, rewind or fast forward there. And uh, this does have on-screen programming. It's a six event timer and you can program it for up to a year ahead which I don't know how many other VCRs at this time had that, but that's, that's pretty fancy. Uh, you can just tell it the month and the day to uh, record, as well as the time and what speed to record at and what channel to tune to and stuff like that. Very nice. It's got a frame advance when you're paused. It's actually got a slow motion. You can trigger the auto tracking and you can track it manually as well. Remote for this thing is model RMT V272. When you look at the back of this thing, you begin to see what makes this thing a commercial market VCR. Coming over here, you can see the video in and out are BNC connectors, not RCA connectors. So I actually have to use my BNC to RCA adapter to uh, get recordings into and out of this thing. And look what we have here! Where have we seen this connector before? Well, it's actually on the back of this CVM. Recall from my CVM video, this is called an EIAJ8 connector. It's an 8-pin connector that was originally developed as a way to connect the early reel-to-reel -reel videotape recorders to a television set that also had this connector. And it was a way to connect the VTR to the TV using only one cable that provided not only composite video out and audio out for the TV, but it also provided an AV input from the TV's TV tuner so that you could make recordings off of broadcast television using the TV's own tuner because the VTR itself didn't have a television tuner. And while that connector died out for consumer use after, I think, the 60s, I, I think it wasn't even very far into the 70s when consumer equipment stopped using that connector, you could still find this connector on professional equipment into the 90s. Now, the fact that this VCR has this connector is kind of redundant because this VCR has its own cable tuner. It has no reason to need to have a video input uh, coming from a TV's tuner. However, if you look right here, it says TV out. So I have a feeling that this is probably not using um, all the pins. I have a feeling that uh, there's actually no video input capability on this. They've only connected the pins for video output to connect to a video monitor that has this connector. Just as an easy way to you know, not have to use the composite output or the RF output in case you wanted to use those for other equipment. We have a, I'm guessing that's a grounding strap of some sort, that little metal lug sticking out of there. And then we have a Control S jack. This was, I think, a Sony proprietary standard for controlling equipment and they ha they have this connector on a bunch of other stuff. I think the Betacam SP VCR I have here has a Control S jack. You have your RF in and out, and it is a combined VHF UHF for the RF in. You have your channel selection for the RF out, and these adjust the still image, 
one adjustment for SP and one for EP. And uh, of course the LP doesn't get one because uh, uh, it's hard to get a still image on LP anyway. But these just, just adjust um, so that you get a clean field of video when you pause in either SP or EP. And uh, over here, model SVO 1410, 18 watts, made in Japan, and the date code is C2, third quarter of 1992. And another way you can tell this is a VCR that's been adapted for the commercial market, look at this super thick cord. Like, this is like a 20 amp cord or something like that. I mean, the actual wires inside it might not be that thick, but the cord itself is a super heavy duty cord. Really, really nuts. Very impressive. So, with that, let me turn on my monitor. I have uh, the RF output of this thing going into it. And our test playback tape today is this. CBC Television 1998-99 Season Announcement Press Tape. This came in a big box of CBC archive tapes that uh, somebody gave us at the station. Someday I've got to go through and archive these. But let's stick this in. It's a quick load system, so it immediately loads the tape, and actually this one, it starts playing automatically because there's no, no uh, record tab. So here you go. Pretty decent video quality. Given the condition this thing's in. Good sound as well. I see a little bit of chroma noise. That I'm guessing would not be there if this thing were healthier. So, we have a linear tape counter, you can see, very nice, indicates the speed during playback and record. It's got this neat, uh, it's got two dot matrix portions on the display, which is pretty neat. It's got an X2 there, I don't think this has X2 playback, that would be where it plays at double speed. I'm not, uh, I'm not seeing that on the remote. Let's try the pause function, see what kind of a pause image we get. And I would expect better for a forehead dual azimuth machine. I suppose it's a little bit better than what a two head machine would give you, but not as good as what a forehead machine would normally give you. Um, I, I, I suspect this would have originally been better. Um, there's our frame advance. Oh, that's a pretty okay picture. And go into slow, slow mode there. I can slow it down. There's as slow as it goes. Yeah, it doesn't hold every uh, field very well. And then I'll speed it up. And there, that's two fields per second. Here's forward search. Pretty good picture. And reverse search. This is an EP recording I made on this VCR and if I hit pause you get a perfect still image in EP which is kinda neat. Um, reverse search see what LP looks like. Pretty bad image in LP. 
pretty bad pause image. Now, a dual azimuth machine does have a bit more capability for a clean pause image in all three speeds, but I think even LP is generally the redheaded stepchild that is usually uh, no VCR can provide a perfect still image in in LP. And there's the slow motion. Pretty bad. Uh, I'll go back to the SP version or the SP portion of this recording. And that's actually a pretty okay pause image. And there's slow motion. Not bad. But, uh, funny enough, the EP um, speed has the best pause picture. Now let's take a look at what the video and audio quality from this thing is actually like. I'm going to start with a uh, recording from television. And after that, we're going to do what we always do, which is hook this camcorder up to the video input on this VCR and record from the camcorder directly to VHS. Okay, all in favor of tabling this motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay, that is four. And Councillor Neal, is that, are you voting in favor of uh, tabling this? Sorry, I wasn't, I wasn't sure anybody could see me. <laughs> uh, are, are you uh, in favor of tabling or are you hoping to, uh, are you voting against this just for the record since I can see you? <laughs> You're very small uh, from here. <laughs> I just wanted to ask a couple if I could. Yeah, I, I think we'll allow it just in the circumstance of Councillor Neal uh, kind of being over there. Uh, you know, it's not obviously ideal when we go to the vote, but uh, I think we should allow it just to hear from all members of Council equally. Go ahead, Councillor Neal. Uh, again, so... One of my concerns is, well, one of my questions, I guess, right off the bat is, why were bicycles not included in this originally? Um, I mean, I see just as many bicycles, young kids on bicycles that wouldn't be on the street going up the sidewalks. So I'm kind of curious as to know why bicycles were never included in it. Um, the other question I had is, reading the bylaw as it's written right now, I'm not sure... My thought was actually that it made more sense to repeal this bylaw and even rewrite it if, if that was the case. Because um, right now it doesn't differentiate between scooters. Um, I heard Councillor Heenan say that scooters are allowed on the road. There are scooters that are allowed on the sidewalks as well. And I'm thinking of scooters. And there's no you know, definition in here. There's no differentiating between them. Um, it just simply states scooters and it's flat out right ban. Um, so again, to me, it's the wording of it's very ambiguous and it, it could definitely be tightened up. Um, so honestly, my feeling was I was leaning more towards repealing it. We are now recording on the Sony SVO 1410 VHS VCR from 1992, the rebranded Sanyo full of bad capacitors so we'll see how this recording turns out because every time I use this thing it just gets worse and worse but here it is recording in the SP speed and I'll get the shots up here that I usually get And I will use the remote to switch it into LP. And we are now recording at the LP speed. And now I'll switch to EP. And we are now recording at the EP speed. You can barely see what's going on. You can barely read the tape counter because of the ghosting that's so bad. The whole display is lit up. And I'll switch it back to SP. And we're back in SP mode. And that concludes the test. Here's the inside of the unit. The top cover comes off with 
two screws on each side. And uh, this is actually one of the more easily serviced VCRs that I've ever personally seen. Um, power supply, switching power supplies right here. Remove a screw there, and I think there's one or two screws on the back. Unscrew the ground cable, and then the power supply just lifts out of place, and you can take it away from the VCR to work on it. Um, this board unscrews here, 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 and here and then the whole board just comes up and grants you access to the other side as well as to a board underneath which is kind of nice and here's the deck there's our head drum and I've only learned this recently actually thanks to uh, Probnot who on his channel Probnot's Tech has an excellent video describing the various uh, video head configurations of VCRs and how to identify them. Um, but if you look at this head drum, it looks like it only has two heads. Right? There's only, there's only two places where you see heads. And so, for most of the time that I've had this thing, I thought it was a two-head unit. But it's not. It's a four-head dual azimuth. And most four-head VCRs pretty much since the mid or late 80s are four-head dual azimuth and what dual azimuth means is basically the second set of heads is bumped right up against the first set of heads so instead of a set of heads here and a set of heads here both sets of heads are right here I can't get you a good close-up unfortunately but inside that hole is actually two of the video heads and then on the other side is the other two video heads in a single hole and how you can determine this from the outside is that a normal head has just three adjustment holes on the top here whereas a dual azimuth head has uh, four holes like you can see here so this is a four head dual azimuth machine one set of heads for SP and LP and then right up next to them is the other set of heads for EP. And because this doesn't have hi-fi stereo, um, you don't see any other heads. So the videos I've made in the past of my two hi-fi stereo VCRs, the Memorex MVR4046 and the Panasonic PV8450, I look at the head drums and I go, oh look, one head, two head, three head, four head, this is a four head deck, when in reality, uh, two of the heads are dual azimuth heads for the video and then the other two were the hi-fi audio heads and I just didn't realize it at the time and that flawed knowledge carried over to when I got this unit and I thought it was only a two head deck but it is a four head dual azimuth unit so there you go um, I'll put our tape back in And you can see it load up there and it starts playing. And uh, if I try to do a forward search using the front panel control, oh, it's not even responding anymore. Well, there you go. How about reverse search? Yeah, it just does it for a split second. So this brings me to the mechanical issue that this thing has. And that issue is with rewinding. Uh, fast forwarding a tape in this thing works totally fine, but if you try to rewind a tape in this, and the tape is the least bit tight, it won't rewind. And it's not like the motor is stalling out. It's not. The motor is actually whirring away just fine when you go to rewind, but the torque isn't being transmitted to the supply reel to rewind the tape. The rewind in this thing actually runs through a slip clutch just like it does when you're playing the tape. And I don't know why. Was it designed this way and it's just a flawed design? Or is there some sort of clutch lockup that's supposed to happen when you hit rewind and it's not locking up in this unit for some reason? I don't know. But when you go to rewind, the torque is transmitted through a slip clutch, and if the tape is the least bit tight, 
it just won't rewind. So I'll try it right now. And it's working fine because this is a really short tape and the tape is in good shape. But, but it doesn't take very much for it to not be able to rewind the tape. So that's, that was the major issue with this thing. Even before all the electronic stuff happened. Here's what you get when you take the bottom panel off. Kind of a funny looking mechanism. You've got this rack here, which moves this way, and then the two loading arms are like a couple of articulated arms, and I don't know, me, me, I, it's probably nothing unusual, I'm just not used to seeing it looking like this. One belt runs the show in this thing, you've got a direct drive capstan, and then one belt going to the real drive. And you know what I just realized? This belt is petrified. It is not in good shape at all. And I just put a tape in and tried to rewind it. And indeed, this belt is slipping. The capstan's whirring away, but this isn't uh, spinning. Now, this isn't related to the original rewind problem. When I first got this thing, the belt was the first thing I checked. It was actually fine back then, just a few months ago. But what would happen is... This would spin, and this would spin, but uh, this is what houses the, or no, this uh, gears with this, and then this has the slip clutch, and so all this was spinning just fine, but the slip clutch was slipping too much. But now that I'm seeing that this belt is slipping, I wonder if the original problem worked itself out? Um, and now this belt is what's causing the issue, so let me... Yeah, wow, it's, it's petrified. Holy cow. So let me put a new belt on here, find a known tight tape, and see if it works better now. That belt is absolutely the wrong thickness, but it'll have to do. I do need to order another square belt kit. After uh, years of VCR repairs, I'm finally getting low on belts. But it is working. We'll... Uh, Power it on here, and the tape I have in it right now, it was not able to rewind before. That was fast forward, and I do rewind. And, uh, yeah. It's working just fine. So, the original slip clutch issue did not, resur did not resurface. That did, in fact, fix itself. It was just the belt then went bad <laughs> and caused the same symptoms. So I'm glad I figured that out. So mechanically, this thing's fine now. Um, it's just those electronic issues with the front panel buttons not working right and, and stuff like that. So, cool. Uh, I'll hit play here. There's what it looks like playing. And I'll hit stop. And I'll hit eject. So there you go. Well that's about all there is to show of the Sony model SVO 1410 commercial grade VHS VCR from 1992. I gotta say, um, if it weren't for all of its electronic issues, I would consider keeping this because this is kind of a cool looking VCR. It's very unique with the classic Sony industrial white color scheme. And uh, the whole layout of it is pretty cool. It's a pretty nice VCR. Once it's working properly and whatever and whatever bad capacitors have reformed, the video and audio quality are actually pretty good at all three speeds. But, nonetheless, I'm uh, glad this thing's going to be out of my hair soon because uh, I have too many VCRs going on now. And I'm sure the young fella that I'll be giving this to um, will enjoy it nonetheless. So there you go. I have one more video of a VHS VCR to make and then you guys will be free from them for a while. And let me tell you, this next VCR that we'll be taking a look at is one of my bucket list VCRs. I can't believe I found one, and it works perfectly. 
and it's such a cool unit. I can't wait to show you guys that one. But for now, that's all there is for this VCR. I do hope you enjoyed. A big thanks to my Patreon supporters whose support helped me pay for things like dozens upon dozens of capacitors and belts and other things that I use to try and fix this crap. But to everyone else, your viewership is greatly appreciated. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Well, I think the best explanation for that is that this kind of served the same market that this Sony CVM... Those are my legs.